Love this podcast? Support it and sponsor today. Simply head to OzCastNetwork.com for details. Bank of the West is offering the 1% for the Planet checking account. It gives back to the planet at no cost to you, and there's no monthly service charge with any deposit per statement. Only from Bank of the West. Learn more at BankOfTheWest.com slash 1%. Additional conditions apply. Member FDIC. The Cat of the Red and Friends. From first love to happy ever after. What's that? From dating to dick pics. Oh my. Oh no. The Cat of the Red and Friends. <laughs> Oh, I love a good dick. This podcast contains sexual references, coarse language and adult themes from the beginning and throughout. It is not recommended for listeners under the age of 15. Guess what, lovers? The Catchalorette, there's always a catch, is back on stage in 2021. First up, The Mill, Adelaide Fringe Festival, from the 18th to the 28th of February, 7.30. Tickets on sale at the Adelaide Fringe website. Hello, beautiful people, and welcome to the Catchalorette and Friends. I'm your host, Carla Anita Matiazzo, and today's guest is Dan Haberfield. He's an actor, a writer, and a filmmaker. Welcome to the podcast, Dan. Thank you, Carla. It's a pleasure to be here. (laughs) Thanks, man. Thanks for coming on. So we got in touch with each other through a mutual friend. Now, I haven't even asked, how do you know Holly? Holly and I met in Los Angeles about 12 months ago. Now, she went over there to do a one-on-one with a, a program called the Hollywood Immersive and I'd done some work with them in the past. And so Lily, who runs Hollywood Immersive, mm-hmm. asked me to come in and be a scene partner for some of the work that Holly was doing. And from obviously digging deep into the, the, the scene study there, we actually you know, created quite a strong friendship and have kept in regular contact. The whole, we hung out in LA and all that sort of mm-hmm. stuff. And then um, back here in Oz, we've, we've kept in regular contact and, and chat. Yeah, she's a babe. She's lovely. Ah, she's, she's a legend. She's very, she's re- yeah, very she's I'm not sure. Ta- I'm not sure what she'd say about me. I think she'd have other, you know, other descriptions, but she is a legend. She's wonderful. <laughs> no, she said nothing but beautiful things about you. She was very enthusiastic about you coming onto the pod. So well, that the- is because I paid her, Carla. I told her, I told her, you know, to talk things up a little bit and she's, <laughs> She's going to hit me with a big bill, so that's all right. (laughs) Okay, so by now the listeners know that this podcast is based on my award-winning cabaret show, The Catchalorette, There's Always a Catch, where I talk and sing about first crushes to happy ever after and everything in between. So let's start there, Dan. Can you remember your first crush and the story around that? Oh, I reckon I had a couple when I was a, as a wee young lad. I, um, probably the one that comes to mind was even in kindergarten, it was, uh, yeah, there was a bit of a crush there and, mm-hmm. and that, that lasted for yeah, a good period of time. And there was, uh, some connection there later in life, but yeah, that was probably oh. the first one. Yeah. Oh, uh, so what was it about this kindergartner? I'm assuming you were at kindy at that time also. I was. I was <laughs> It'd be very scary if I wasn't. That would be... <laughs> so what was it about her that made you go, I don't, ooh? I don't know. It was just it was something, uh, I think, somehow we must have connected like it's Mm -hmm. it's kind of like I don't almost remember anything else from kindergarten or I can't remember specifically I just knew that there was something that I was attracted to about her and then um Mm -hmm. yeah over the course of time you know I think I grew up in a big family as well and we you know we had lots of cousins and brothers and sisters and family friends and that Mm -hmm. I think you also just socialize with people and I don't know. You probably have a crush without realizing you're the crush because you're just you're being friendly with people. Yeah. And, and I do remember when I was in um, 
prep, there was another girl, who I, this different girl that I had a crush on, and uh, we uh, used to play Star Wars, and, and I was Luke Skywalker, and she was uh, Princess Layla, and I'd pick her up and run around the, the playground, like carrying her off into the far distant galaxy, and I think it was just being kids, but, you know, maybe it's a crush, I'm not sure, but yeah, that's probably the earliest memories that I have of it, yeah. That's really cute. So where was the far off galaxy in the playground? What area in the school grounds was that? Oh, in? would have been the far corner of the, uh, the nipple course just past the library. And uh, <laughs> probably, probably a, a couple of bike sheds there where I might have detoured around the back of every now and then. you think of high school relationships as like training wheel relationships where you get mm-hmm. to learn a bit about yourself you get to learn about relationships under a kind of pgm rating without any responsibilities so did mm-hmm. you have any of those types of relationships did you have any teenage romances oh i, I had a had a couple i i went f- from primary school I, I had the odd couple of girlfriends, you know, like, oh yeah, you know, the sort of girl, girlfriend that you have for two terms without actually saying a word to. <laughs> uh, so there was a couple. Of, there was a couple of them, and I was very interested in my sport. Right. And I, I suppose you could say I was, you know, uh, you know, I had a large group of friends, but I wouldn't wouldn't by any means say I was like the most popular person or necessarily garnered, you know, the attention of the uh, the females as. as as much as you would like to. So going to high school then, uh, that for some reason changed a little bit. I think I just went in as a really hyperactive, almost ADHD, you know, super excited kid in year seven. And mm-hmm. and all of a sudden I started to get a little bit of attention that I probably hadn't had before. And, and I had no idea, no concept whatsoever on how to deal with that. And I think... I end up with like seven or eight different girlfriends through year seven. And I'd be surprised if any of them lasted more than maybe a couple of weeks. And yeah. and again, I, did, I didn't even really know how to talk to them, but I, I was good at being friends with girls, but I was just yeah. like, you know, Oh, now I've got to be a boyfriend. What, what does a boyfriend do? Like, I just want to go kick the footy. You know what? I, you mean I've got to talk to her? What do I talk to her about? You know, like it was that sort of stuff. And, um, uh, and, yeah, so it was a bit bit of a change. And then, yeah, it was, I don't know, yeah, over the next few years, I sort of had different girlfriends for little bits and, and all that. So, yeah. So how did that, you that transition, was... Dan, from going to, oh, I have to talk to her, I just want to go kick the footy, to, oh, hello, the opposite sex. How? When did that change? Oh, uh, gee. I think... It'd probably be obviously mid to later high school. You start, mm-hmm. you, you you start to notice things, uh, mm-hmm. so to speak, and and your body's just going crazy. Your mind's going a bit crazy. You, know, yeah. you start going to parties, and and you know certain girls who you may not have noticed before, are all of a sudden on your radar, or or in different classes. You know, mm-hmm. um, you know, like you you end up in a class with a certain girl that you thought was, a, you know, like you know, too arrogant or something like that. And all of a sudden you become really good mates with them. And it's like, Oh, this person's entirely different, you know, mm-hmm. to, to what you thought. And so I suppose evidently then you, you're starting to go to parties and, you know, you, you're trying to pick up and trying to do stupid things to impress the girls. And yeah, like what? Like off. what, Dan? Like what? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, if there was a dress up day at school, I suppose, you had to make sure you stood out. Okay. You know, I do remember going in in a short skirt and <laughs> and fishnet stockings one day. And oh, hello! You know, I think uh, it allowed the girls to come and talk to you a bit because you know that. Oh, and Rossi boots. Sorry, the fishnet stockings and Rossi boots. It was a really classy look. And <laughs> so I, I suppose doing something like that, where some of the other boys may not have been as uh, excited about the dress up, I probably 
use that as an opportunity to go, well, you know, the, the girls Look can come and talk to me now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and that, that's probably more in retrospect than, than necessarily realising that at the time. So how long do you think was your longest high school relationship or was there a, a female that stood out amongst the training wheel relationships? Uh, so the, between sort of year seven and nine, they were very much short termers. Yeah. Uh, maybe a few weeks. If, if anything got to a term, I'd be massively surprised, but I don't really recall how long they were. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember in year 12, I had a girlfriend for about three months at one stage. Uh, and then on the very last night of year 12, uh, the uh, young lady from the kindergarten and I started uh, started going out on oh. the very last night of year 12. And uh, that lasted about 15 months. So that went into the uh, the university years. So, oh, right. Yeah. So did she go to the same high school as you or were you in? She did. She went to a okay. different primary school. Right. Uh, hence... Hence why things were put on ice. I mean, it was basically the relationship in kindergarten was really showing potential. We were uh, probably, you know, just moving forward with things progressively. And then, you know, primary school really interrupted the way that uh, that, that progression was uh, going. And then, right. yeah, high school, we were... We reunited. Oh, beautiful. Um, what a love story, Dan. What a love yeah. story. Even then, I still didn't talk to her until year 10. So, you know. <laughs> okay, paint me a picture. Paint the listeners a picture of the last day of year 12. How did that all unfold? Well, when we started to go to parties and that around, you know, year 10 and all the year 11 type thing, there was one party in particular uh after a dead ball um yeah like uh she she didn't hold her alcohol particularly well and so i sort of just went over and made sure i sat with her and looked after her well, to make sure you know nice. she was all right for the night but that tended to happen almost every party from then on <laughs> uh, yeah. for the next year and a half and which i was fine with like you know it was uh it is what it was. Not every party, but it was the majority of them. And anyway, at the end of year 12, when we had a final party, yeah, the same scenario. And then... Um, so did you go to university together then as well? Or did you nah, go No, no. Nah, I, I moved away to university. That was that. That was that. <laughs> was there a conversation around you going away to uni or was it just a unsaid thing? Oh, okay, you're going off to uni. That's that then. Probably the only real option. I was not trade-minded. Um, I did consider trying to take a building apprenticeship for a fleeting moment so I could <laughs> sort of hang about town, but I kind of realised fairly quickly that wouldn't be me. Uh, Why? I, so I was Why, always, <laughs> oh, I'm just not a builder, <laughs> you know. Although a couple of years ago I did help my brother build a house, uh, oh, I suppose. There you go. But no, it was never something I was particularly interested in and, and I had to sort of think of the the reasons why I would look at doing that. Mm -hmm. and they weren't sort of uh, fulfilling what I required, I suppose, for a career. Right. And so I decided to go away to uni. And, um, yeah, it was obviously a good time. It put, obviously, it put stress on the, the relationship in many ways. And, and I suppose I started to open up to a bigger world yeah. and realised that I needed to go and... I don't know, just chase whatever was out there. But I always felt I'm probably fairly independent by nature. And so I always felt that I needed to do that uh, on my own, not necessarily with somebody else by my mm -hmm. side. And so that kind of probably led to the uh, finality of sorts. Yes. Dan, what lessons did you learn from those younger years in uh, those relationships? Um, yeah, it's, it's a tough one because I think particularly that age and, you know, even going through your twenties, you're kind of raised and almost conditioned to expect that we should have, uh, deep and meaningful relationships, which 
in a, in a um, in a romantic sense. And so I think you find yourself doing that before you actually know who you are yourself. Mm-hmm. And as a result, I feel like a lot of people and a lot of people I know, and I felt like I did it as well. I, I started to live my partner's life in many ways uh, rather than living my life and finding something or someone that you know, you're complimentary, complimentary with. Mm-hmm. Um, I think if the, if the pendulum swings too far either way, then ultimately there's going to be a, a line to be drawn in the sand where one of the people in the relationship eventually says this isn't working. Yeah, sure. And so I kind of felt that I gave, and, and you know, it's tough to say because, you know, there's various relationships and through the 20s, uh, I mean, I can put my hand up and say all the girls that I've had, you know, more meaningful, longer term relationships with, I can definitely say they're great girls. And it was never really, oh, no, you know, she's a bitch. I don't want to be with her. It was never that. It always, for me, felt like I've handed my life over to this person, but this is not who I want to be. Sure. I need to, I need to reclaim who I am and go and maybe even find that. And I, I think it was sort of late twenties, early thirties that I really put my hand up and actually started to own up to who I was. Yes. And then pursue that journey. So is that where the uh, shift in career came about around that time? Ab- Dan? Ab- absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So I finally owned up to something that I'd always wanted to do since I was a little kid and that was to start acting. And so whilst I was a PE teacher, I started doing uh, or taking some acting classes at night. And uh, the first moment I walked into the, the first class, I just knew straight away that this is what I wanted to pursue. So uh, I knew at the end of that year, I was going to give up full-time teaching and, and just throw myself into the gauntlet and see where it, where yep. it came out. And part of that was I'd just come out of a breakup with a girl and like what I said before, I just really didn't, feel like I knew who I was or sure. what I wanted, you know? So, so what yeah. I'm hearing from what you're saying there, Dan, it's really important to you, whatever relationship you're in or future relationships or whatever your current status is that you need to be with somebody that is a good teammate that you both individually stand alone as unique, wonderful whole people. And then you come together as a team, not as two halves that come together as a whole, like many past, you know, happily Mm -hmm. ever after Disney anecdotes will have us believe. Sure. That's, I mean, it sounds, yeah, sounds about right to me. Like I haven't, probably haven't spent a lot of time over the last decade or so thinking about it, to be honest, because I do, I do tend to believe in fate somewhat that ultimately one day you will, you know, cross paths with somebody who you're meant to be with. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I don't spend a lot of time really, you know, worrying about it too much. Would you say that you are somebody that, very much lives in the moment, then if you don't spend time hypothesizing or wondering about the future, because the the game of entertainment that we're both in is can change dramatically from one day. On a moment's notice. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so I think I spent enough time pre 30 years of age. Mm-hmm worrying about that, trying to be somebody who, you know, the girls might like or who, you know, or being, you know, um, probably part of my uh, reason for, you know, handing myself over and living their life was to try and, you know, purely focus on keeping them happy, but not actually recognizing what made me happy. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I just feel like that was a really unproductive way of living in the end. Yeah. And, when I went through that last breakup, I was just before I turned 30 and you know, it's always crushing. Like even if you're the person ending the relationship, you know, I've never once, you know, really found that an easy thing to do. Or there was one where we, we did break up and we're actually really good mates still, but it was, <laughs> it was, 
I was really worried and I rang her up and I said, listen, I, I don't want to be a, a prick or anything, but she cut me off and said, you want to break up? And I said, um, yeah, I do. Cause I, I tried to catch up with her face to face for like a week before this, but yeah. we just couldn't get a time. So hence it had to be done over the phone call before the next party, just in case I ran into this other girl at that party. You know what I mean? Like it's just, yeah. so I thought I've got to make the phone call. And she said, yep, yeah, great. Yeah. So do I. And then we, we chat, <laughs> chatted for like an hour. So it was like, and we're still really good mates. We catch up well, that's you know, nice. um, quite regularly. So it's like, that was the easy one. But other than that, they've all been really, really difficult and, you know, heart wrenching moments where you just feel absolutely gutted that, you know, cause I, it's not like any of them have had a clear cut reason. Oh, you know, such and such cheated on me. So I'm cutting it off. Mm-hmm. It, there was none of that. It was always, um, just didn't feel right. You know, it didn't feel right. And like I said before, I just felt like I needed to find it who I was. And I felt like I needed to do that independently of, of another person. So, you know, I kept going through that cycle, I suppose. Yeah, it's funny because, you know, there's, there's three sort of more serious relationships that have all lasted 15 months. It's like just a little coincidental that it gets to that time. So I found myself doing that. Have you always been the one breaking up with the person besides the one that you just explained? Have, have yeah. You, okay. Uh, so, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, I have. Um I'm just trying to think back. Yeah, I mean, there was a couple of high school ones where the girl broke it off with me, but that was... That was like, high school. Oh, cool. Now, Raining wheel. <laughs> Raining <laughs> that was like, cool, now I can go play footy without actually worrying about it. <laughs> so it was like, I don't Sorry. think I ever got particularly worried about that. But um, but I was just going to say there before, so the last one that I, you know, we broke up just before my 30th and, and I haven't had another relationship since then. Mm-hmm. And I think part of that was... I said to myself at the time, this is just too hard to keep going in and out of these types of yep. scenarios. Correct. And my mind and my heart was focused on pursuing the creative stuff. And as we touched on before, you know, when you're involved in the creative world, there's just so many unknowns and unpredictables. And, it's, and I, I describe it like it's a game of Tetris with all the blocks, you know, dropping from the top and <laughs> you've got to line them all up. Yeah. Or, yep. uh, Adding, adding in somebody else in your life and having to cross-check all of those elements with that person before you can make a decision or commit to, you know, and I'm a bit of a nomadic sort of person. I like to be on the move and I, like, I don't like to be stuck in or anchored in one place. So that's what I kind of mean by having somebody who complements that, who's, who's, and I'm certainly not against, you know, having a relationship, but I think now I have a clear understanding of what my parameters are. Of, mm-hmm. You know, I'm not, I have things in my life that are really important that, you know, um, I think, you know, you need to be able to gel together on certain things. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, I'm not going to be a nine to five lockdown in the one place for the rest of my life. And yep. so, you know, that's, that's kind so of you, part of the package. Exactly. So do you think then, it would be highly unlikely and I'm <laughs> guessing here because obviously neither one of us can predict the future. Uh, well, not that I know of anyway. Mm-hmm. I actually have that skill. Oh, you do? No, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you're enjoying this episode of The Catchlerette and Friends. Make sure you follow the podcast at The Catchlerette Pod on Instagram and If you think your love journey is worth sharing with me on the podcast, send me an email, thecatchelorettepod at gmail.com or slide into my Instagram DMs. Oh, and don't forget to give the podcast a review and tell all your motherfucking people to listen to the show. Now let's get back to this episode. I would then assume by what you've just said, the person that you end up gravitating towards would not be a nine to five a human being, or if they are, would have something else in their lives that they are pursuing that they're passionate about. Yeah, I think that's fair. Like I, I strongly 
again, I, got, I probably don't spend a lot of time thinking, thinking about the thinking type of person. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but it would be surprising to me if I fell for somebody who's nine to five and is settled in the one place and can see their life playing out in that one place, doing that one job mm-hmm. for the rest of their life. For me, that sounds way too monotonous. The thing I love about the creative lifestyle is we get thrown from bridge to bridge and up and down and into the valley, over to the river. We, we, we end up anywhere and everywhere. And I find that exciting. I find that yes. enthralling and mm-hmm. exhilarating. And, and I love throwing myself into other worlds. Like when you're an actor and you, you take on a character who lives a lot. For me, it's a, the greatest excuse in the world to go and do all these different things, you know? And I just, I can't fathom staying in the one place forever. You know, it's, it'll happen one day. I'm sure I'll change my mind. I'll say I'm, I'm sick of being on the move, but I, I just don't know when that's going to be yet. You know? It's interesting what you've just said. So many people would find that lifestyle fucking terrifying. Especially all the boys that I grew up with. That's what they crave is normalcy, structured, daily routines um and you know they, they, they didn't name he used to always sort of get stuck in me he'd call me a gypsy because it's like <laughs> you know i'd be i think i've moved from warrnambool to ballarat to sydney to melbourne to london back to melbourne over to la over back to melbourne over to new york back to melbourne you know like and back oh. back a few times and all that and it's like for me that that i, I get excited by it. it's like I, okay well, you know where can i go you know, where can I set up life? Where, where can I try this out? Where, and um, mm-hmm. for those boys, it's like they just want one place to live and know exactly what's going to happen every day. And that's good because that works for them. Correct. But it just, it's never, never worked well for me. Yeah. I, I mean, it, it has this year because there wasn't much choice with COVID and, Correct. and with a bit of maturity, I think I can say, okay, I can accept, you know, what's happening that this is going to impact. All right. I'm going to be based here for a while now. Okay and things have fallen into place with regular work and and all that so that's been fine but um i think once the world does open up again you know the oyster sort of you know starts to glisten a bit more and you you start to go okay where am i going to go next Uh, (laughs) we'll see stay tuned stay tuned everybody stay tuned oh how long do you think you're guesstimating that you'll stay where you are Uh, in my physical location yes yeah uh, it could be, well, I've got a play here to do next year. Great. Uh, we were actually going to do it at the start, at start of this year. Uh, the, What's the, the play? Uh, What's the play, the, Dan? Uh, the Crucible, yes. uh, which is Love an Arthur play. Miller classic. Yeah. So oh. we started rehearsals and then um, that'll get put on the back burner. Mm-hmm. But they've postponed it obviously until next year. So that, that will keep me here as well as uh, some teaching work that I've got. So after that, which will probably be middle of next year, um, I need to yeah, make some decisions around that time. Are you feeling uh, a bit itchy? Are you feeling, cause you're so used to moving. Are you starting to feel a bit like itchy? Like fuck now I just want to. <laughs> there, there's moments a fleeting thought where you go, hmm, and you visualize where you, you know, where you could be. And then I just got to park that for a little bit and go, okay. So if when I, you're if visualizing, I card, where are you visualizing, Dan? Well, with, with the US uh, having a green card, there's always obviously that, mm-hmm. that uh, prospect of going back there. Um, but, you know, I'm probably one of those ones that looks at it at the moment goes, you know, I need to make some decisions about whether that's the right move given the current uh, conditions okay. over there. Um, if not, from in Australia, it'll probably be, you know, potentially be up along the um, sort of Queensland, New South Wales, um, you know, the Northern Rivers area there. There's, you know, quite a bit of uh, sort of um, opportunities that look like they could present themselves up that way. So, Awesome. That's also an option there. Brilliant. That's really good, Dan. But nothing, nothing, nothing's locked in at the moment. But yeah, yeah but nothing is. It's okay. It's all right. This is where That's we're it. at at the moment. 
It's all that's, good. That's, that's the committophobia. That's the committophobia coming out of me, by the way. So, do you think, Dan, with what you've just said there, do you think because it's been a decade of focusing on building who you are, focusing on your career and your passions? And I'm asking this because it's something that I worry about within myself. Do you mm-hmm. think that there is a wall that has been built up that you? I I definitely had it, definitely had it. Like as in, I think I think it even became a wall of uh, repelling any <laughs> prospective opportunities. As in. You know, without me necessarily even knowing it, but I think uh, it became as an avoidance tactic. And for me, uh, the the option of, uh, uh, I suppose, having a little fun without... Basically, I was I was entering even the dating scene with exit, exit strategies in mind. So if I started to see somebody uh, sort of more than once or twice, it was like I'm already calculating what my exit strategy is right and i don't think that's a healthy situation and i think that's definitely that wall that you're talking about it's like you know anytime i felt somebody uh getting close to me yeah. i certainly slammed that wall up as quick as i could and backtracked as quick as i could to get out of there and um again there's a you know uh, the, couple of those situations and um that's not uh, necessarily a, a great way to li- live your life, if, you, if that makes sense. So, but I think over time, you know, that wall has certainly eroded. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I've had some scenarios in the past sort of couple of years where, you know, you might have become a little bit closer to, to somebody and, and that felt okay all of a sudden. It was like, okay, this is, this is what things could, um, could be like. Um, if you open yourself up to it, but again, it's like, it's, it's still a caution, but certainly yeah. not a wall anymore. Do you think it's a self-preservation thing? Keeping people. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It's a self-preservation for yourself. Cause you know, especially as actors, we have a huge degree of empathy. Uh, I think quite naturally we, we, you know, when we're jumping into other characters, mm-hmm. we have to start to think and feel about, those characters and what's affecting them and how they feel about certain scenarios in the script. And I think that also is part of uh, a lot of actors personalities. Their, their actual natural state is to be very empathetic. Yes. Um, And when I, when I did um, break up with girlfriends, especially girls who you've been really, really close with and live with, you know, like there's a couple of times I've lived with girlfriends and you, you are, you know, phenomenally close physically, but also you know, emotionally at times. And, and, you know, then you've got their, their extended families and you, you sort of yes. come close to them and there's a lot of connections and that's where it's really, really hard to break those connections because you are thinking and feeling about the, the change of the taking place there and, and how much you are hurting the person that you're breaking up with. And, and, I, I probably carry that more than my own feelings. You know, within yourself, you go, okay, I know why I'm doing this. Yes. And I know it's the right decision. It's not easy for me, but I'll get over it very quickly. Yeah. And I'm sure, you know, the girls I broke with, grow up with, I'm sure they got over it very quickly as well. I'm not suggesting, but you know what I mean? Like you, you do feel like you're, you're really hurting somebody in that moment. And particularly when there wasn't a clear cut, reason reason yeah or that 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 uh you know uh, an act of you know uh adultery or whatever they didn't mm-hmm. cheat on you or anything like that yeah uh, not that i know not that i know of anyway Living alone is fucking excellent. Not having to (laughs) negotiate or compromise or check in with somebody, I find 
liberating and I mm-hmm. find it really bizarre when I hear friends that have boyfriends or husbands or whatever and they cannot make a decision before they check in with the schedule of their loved one. I understand mm-hmm. it. People are a unit when they get together. I'm not judging. I just enjoy the fact that I can fucking make a decision without having to check in. With mm-hmm. I'm hearing you, sister. Don't you worry about that. <laughs> it's, and uh... I think I would... I don't know how, because I've been single for a very long time too, Dan, so I don't know how Mm -hmm. I'd go when and if ever I get into a relationship and I have to go, okay, I'm saying yes, but I have to check if Mm. the man in my life is happy or those schedules align. Like I don't, because yeah. <laughs> no one's going to do Dan. You, you, exactly. And but the thing <laughs> is, is that's probably probably one of the uh, the ground rules you set up front. Yeah. You know what I mean? If, if and if they if they don't like it, then you've got to go. Well, do I want to negotiate on that, or is that a is that yeah. a so uh, how a do you staple? think? one would word that instead of me being a fuckhead and going, just so you know, you can't be telling me what to do. How <laughs> do you think one should wear that in an effective, oh. empathetic, you know, way that will receive a response that is favourable rather than, well, no. <laughs> I suppose just remember that that other person uh, has got their own ground rules too yes yeah and and so if you if you if you see you having a ground rule like that as as a negative or a um an item that might intimidate that person or Mm -hmm. not particularly please them then play some little game where you both you know drop your five five non-negotiable ground rules and okay. if you don't like his, you got, I'm just thinking this off the top of my head. I probably <laughs> don't, know, don't know how I'd go with it if I had to play it in real life. But as an idea, theoretically speaking, it sounds like it could work. You know, mm-hmm. you find, mm-hmm. Like people, people say, yeah, what's your, what's your five worst traits? You know, what's your, you know, and if they can deal with that, then shit, you know, they'll put up with me. Well, that's great. Mm-hmm. Well, maybe it's what's your five strongest ground rules that you won't negotiate on. At least you'd both know where that boundary is then. And well, you've got at, a choice. What, at what point do you bring that game to the table, Dan? Oh, um, that's, that's probably a tricky one. Yeah. Um, probably haven't been in that situation for a while. If you're honest. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, I don't know. I think you'd probably want to do it in, inside the you know, probably three or four date mark. If you, if you felt like it was... Going Something that, but you haven't got to the point where you've fully committed or whatever yet. Yeah. You're, you're probably too late then. Correct. But um, yeah, probably not the first day. But you know, if you're an upfront sort of person and and that's part of who you are, then maybe maybe you do that. Yeah. Um, and they'll either like it or hate it. If they hate it, they walk away. <laughs> if they like it, they hang about. I want to try this new segment on you, Dan. So you're the person that's going to get this new segment. So it's from He's Just Not That Into You. Now, there is an actual full book um, with all the stuff in it, but this is a daily wake-up call version. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to flip through the book, read what's on the fucking page, and then we'll discuss (laughs) <laughs> Sounds like fun. Are you ready, Dan? Are you ready? <laughs> no, never, but let's flipping. give it a shot anyway. I'm flipping. Okay. <clears throat> Number 222. There is no reason to yell at anyone ever unless you're screaming, look out for that bus. And it's mm. not temporary. People who yell are people with anger issues who need help. People who yell are people who think they're entitled to yell. Hey, hot stuff, do you want to be a couple? Well, you know that couples where the guy yells at his wife all the time? Even better, do you want him to be that dad? I didn't think so. 
Mm. Do you agree or disagree or indifferent I, on that statement? I, I absolutely agree that there is no reason to treat somebody with the disrespect of yelling at them. Mm-hmm. Um, I have had situations with people in the past where uh, they they wanted a fight, they wanted an argument, and I would refuse to give it to them. Mm-hmm. And I would keep my patience and keep my, my composure, and and or you know I'd provide an alternative. Uh, perspective on something for them that um, you know they weren't expecting. They they wanted a confrontation. Yes. But by maintaining that composure, their perception, uh, their perception of what I was doing was um, they felt I was being condescending, <laughs> which I don't quite understand. But yes. my point is that it's particularly if you are with somebody, um, you should have the respect and the courtesy uh, to never yell at them. Mm-hmm. Um, if it gets to a point where, uh, you've had the discussion and, uh, you know, they keep hammering a point, keep hammering a point, keep hammering a point, and they're not listening to what's been given back, then you may need to raise your voice to some degree to get over the top of that and mm-hmm. say this, but, um, yelling, uh, I think people who yell like that says more about the issues that they're having rather than the issues of the other person. And uh, the lack of self-awareness, I think as well, people that true. yell to get their point across and aggressively intimidate mm-hmm. vocally to me mm-hmm. says that there is a lot more going on in their life that they are not able to fix or get help from or are oblivious or articulate. to. Articulate. Yes. Mm. They can't articulate it in, in that respect. And I think there's a real negative defensive mindset that goes with yelling in order to get on the front foot and be intimidating. Yes. Saying, I'm sorry, but you're just not going to intimidate me by that. I'm just going to look at you and go, yeah, just a little bit of an overreaction there. Yes. Buddy. So, Do you um, also maturity as well, Dan? Oh, absolutely. And again, it's, uh, it's something where, You know, as you get older and you spend a lot more time on your own, as I said before about learning to know who you are, Mm -hmm. you become more comfortable in your own skin and you don't feel the need to impress or, you know, to dominate or, uh, you know, any of those types of things. I think when people are perhaps younger and more immature, they feel like they need to be the dominant one in the relationship. So that means getting on top of somebody else and, and teaching them what they should or shouldn't be doing and, and setting rules and ground rules. And if they break, those rules look out because you know i told you not to do that it's like no nah. and when you're older it's just like dude too much of a you know um, control freak too much of a control freak too much of a wind up and that, that, that's not me so i'll go somewhere else you know right so it's yeah so no i don't think there's any need for it to be honest and if you're in a relationship where that's happening on a regular basis then yeah i think the signals are there that you're in the wrong relationship correct I totally agree with that. Final question, Dan. Is there anything that you have not brought up that you would like to bring to the podcast today? Any lessons over heartbreak? Oh, kind of a situation where I got close to somebody last year and that was a tough period, but that's that's all character building and that was there was never any negative sentiments towards that person. It was more circumstances. But in order to uh, dust yourself off. You just got to got to find what works for you in terms of keeping active, exercise, or you know whether it's creative work or writing, or find a way to get yourself occupied, um, your mind occupied, so that you're not dwelling on on certain things. And also just accept that everything happens for a reason, and we don't always necessarily recognise that. Uh, the outcome of something until we have the, you know, the, the benefit of retrospect and that retrospect could be five, six, 12 months down the track. Yeah. Um, Cause that, that event, whether it's heartbreak or, you know, breaking up with somebody or just to even could be you know, a couple of dates with somebody that in itself will set off a sequence of events over time that, will lead to wherever you are right now. And you've just got to accept that that's just part of life. And, 
you know, uh, keep looking forwards rather than, I think Clint Eastwood is renowned for saying it, but he doesn't look back because all he does is end up with a sore neck. And I think <laughs> that's a pretty good attitude. You got to look forward and then follow the road and, and see where it leads. So Beautiful um, sentiments. Yeah. That probably sounds like a closer. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on today, Dan. I appreciate your Thanks. time, your vulnerability and being so open with all the questions. No problems, Carla. Thank you. And as I said, if anyone's still listening, I do apologize if this is not interesting, but I hope it is. I hope you, I hope you've got some sort of entertainment or insight out of that, that I can, you know, sleep easily at night with. So. <laughs> I think <laughs> nah, it was good. It was great fun. How I'm going to come back to your last question for a moment, if I can. Of course you can. You asked, you asked about, you know, some guidance or advice and I, you know, waffled about everything happening for a reason. Communication. Mm-hmm. Now, you know, I think there must be something built into a lot of guys' DNA system that, you know, the communication function has just gone de- by default. It's almost in an off position. Mm-hmm. And it's something that I, and I still don't know how I will be if and when I get, you know, into a closer intimate relationship, how I'll manage that. But that is something that a lot of guys really struggle with. And, and girls will say, oh, you know, you just need to talk about it. Yeah, but but what do we say? How do we say it? it, it, it it's like this foggy, confused, messed up, you know. Um, do you think it's societal like, expectations, Dan, a little bit? It is a bit. I think it's part of it, but I think there is it's something deeper than that. It's not necessarily environmental. I think there's an innate uh, feature to it of sorts that we just, we struggle with articulating. Mm-hmm. And then part of the environmental factor is that we don't want to piss the other person off. Um, mm-hmm. In my case, you know, to be a female, but obviously there's, you know, uh, gay relationships and so forth. But if I use hetero relationships as an example, we don't want to piss that, that lady off because we know the fire that can be breathed back you know, if we say the wrong thing. And so then we become really hesitant to say anything right? because that's almost a safer mode rather than saying the wrong thing. And because the wrong thing, that'll come back at you three months later when you've completely forgot about it five minutes later, but three months down the track, that sometimes comes back in your life. Well, that depends on the person. I think it can. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, but what I'm trying to say is if as guys, we can learn, uh, practice to communicate better and be more articulate with what we're feeling and how we're feeling, you know, and we, we, we probably have, uh, an issue with opening up, uh, to somebody where we are vulnerable. Um, and particularly if that vulnerability has been abused, mm-hmm. which, does happen and I think that's something we carry with us. I know I certainly still have um, reluctance because of the way that I feel that it's been, you know, abused at times. I agree. But yep. ultimately if you're gonna if you're gonna um, find yourself with somebody for the rest of your life, you are gonna have situations where you need to just, you know, get over that and, and open up and be a part of it. As an actor, I think, you know, it's one of the things that make the, the better actors do what they do is that they do open up entirely and, and become really vulnerable in the moment. But transferring that to your personal life is a, is a different it's story. Different. Yeah. It's a different thing. Mm. Uh, it's a very different thing. I'm quite happy to be completely vulnerable and open on stage, but in mm-hmm. my personal life, one-on-one, I find it quite difficult for all the reasons Absolutely. that you've just mentioned and more being vulnerable mm-hmm. is fucking terrifying to me in real life, but I mm-hmm. bring it on when I'm on stage. It's a complete, yeah. I don't know why, but it's just a. I absolutely relate to it. I don't know. Maybe it's a sense of purpose, you know, you, on stage, you know who you are, you know what you've got to do and but in life because you know, we're uh we're creatives and we don't just have one singular uh, frame of mind. We, our, our world is a bit more open. So we sort of drift and, you know, I'm yeah, not sure the reasons I don't want to be guessing, but. And I think what you touched on before about being an empath, creatives are open and vulnerable in that aspect um, which maybe plays into the, I don't want to purposely be vulnerable in my personal life because I know that 
I'm such an empath. Maybe that mm -hmm. plays into it somewhat yeah. because once yeah. you're on stage or in front of the camera and you're supposed to be vulnerable, that's rehearsed. You know what to expect yep. from that scenario in real mm -hmm. life. You fucking don't know how that's yeah. going to be received yep. and what's going to happen yeah. from that. So maybe that might have something to do with that as well. And, and on stage, if you actually impact that person emotionally and they, yeah, and they really feel what you're saying, mm -hmm. that's considered a great performance. Yeah. But on the flip side in real life, if <laughs> they feel that you're the worst person in the whole entire world, it's like, you know, I've always said this, this acting game's crazy in the sense that you can yell and scream and carry on like a complete and whatever. People go, Oh, what a great epic performance. That's amazing. If you walk down the main street and acted in the same, the, they try and lock you up. It's like, <laughs> all right. So, you know, it's a kind of the same with vulnerability. If you open yourself up and you pour it out on stage and everyone's clapping and, you know, you're like, oh, he, he's amazing, he's amazing. And you do that in real life, people say, get over it, mate. Grow up, you know. Um, pull yourself together and get your shit sorted. You know, it's like, so, you know, we, uh, we've got to find some sort of balance about, you know, living on stage and living off stage and, yeah. and how you manage each of those environments. Yeah. It's really interesting. I definitely have worked out the certain friends that I don't have to worry about putting that hard exterior on for. And yeah, it's, it's, it's just an interesting duality. Sometimes we have to play as performers mm -hmm. Because we are innately vulnerable to a certain extent, whether we want to admit it or not. <laughs> That's absolutely. And then there's a, the, let's, you know, a conversation, but it's like people might see you in something, whether it's on stage or on screen. And, and let's be honest, if you're actually half decent at it and you're believable in, in whatever character or role you play, then part of them perceives you as a person being like that. And so you're actually confronting in real life, you meet people and you, you know, you also got that, that preconception to deal with, which is another barrier in terms of building close relationships and blah, blah, blah. So but that's a topic for another time, Carla, maybe, you know, we'll, uh, we'll touch on that one another day. Yeah. Another we can time. do take two. We can do take two. Thank you yeah, again, good. Dan. This is not fun. a problem. Bravo. Thank you. All the best and good luck with everything. Same to you, buddy. Peace out. Cheers. All right. Be good. Take care. The Catchelorette with friends near and far, from heartache to catfish and sex toys. Ooh, ah. The Catchelorette and friends. See you next time if you dare. Bank of the West is offering the 1% for the Planet checking account. It gives back 1% of the account's net revenue to the planet at no cost to you. There's no monthly service charge with any deposit per statement, and there's no minimum balance required. The 1% for the Planet checking account, only from Bank of the West. Learn more at bankofthewest.com slash 1%. Additional conditions apply. Member FDIC. Love this podcast? Support it and sponsor today. Simply head to oscastnetwork.com for details.